Picture yourself in the high, dry desert of northeastern Nevada, rather than my Reno backyard. The wind in the sagebrush sea dances across the valleys, over serpentine mountain ranges, and through hidden canyons. With this short film tour, we wanted to shine light on some of the most challenging issues the entire West is facing that this part of Nevada knows all too well. Extreme drought, the need for flexibility with responsibility in land management, and invasive annual grasses fueling rangeland fires. Within this video, each of these speakers only had a few minutes to share some of their experiences and perspectives. There's so much more to their stories, but we wanted to give you glimpses of what these dedicated and brilliant land managers are working on. The voices in today's video are a few of the many people who have and continue to work for conservation across this part of our beautiful state. The lands in the video are the ancestral homelands of the Northern Paiute, Western Shoshone, and Shoshone Bannock, and we want to recognize them as the original caretakers with vast and expansive knowledge. Thank you so much for taking a piece of your day to explore a beautiful part of our country. Now just sit back, relax, and enjoy this world premiere of addressing drought through proactive restoration and resilience, working with communities in Nevada. Okay, history of Cottonwood Ranch. You know, it, it it's apropos that we're sitting here in front of in front of mom's mom's house, the house I was raised in. Um, so, mom and dad uh, inherited this place from um, their grand from their grandfather, dad's grandfather, who was who had, was the original purchaser from the O'Neills. And uh, when they moved on to the place, it had. This four-room log cabin, this addition is later. There wasn't a tree on the place, there was nothing. And mom always says she had to kick the cat out of the house so that she could live in the, in the cabin, so. Um, and from there, they, uh, they built, they, they turned this into its own uh, enterprise and, and ranch. When they came here, they didn't have any income because they had no cattle, of course. So there was really great mule deer hunting, so that they started the hunting business, which started us into the recreation business, which we're still doing. We still, um, my daughter and son-in-law have the guiding part of the operation now, and uh, we still do some, some uh, summer recreation type stuff and then, and, and run cattle and horses. So um, anyway, and um, here we are. <laughs> Okay, so we're at a place down here. It's um, on Cottonwood Creek below the ranch. We, this is a there's, a, there's a road there. There's a fence up here. This has always been a heavy use area when I, all the time growing up and out here, the, the cattle just kept this pretty well mucked out. I mean, that it, the, it's the only water for a lot of this country out here. It was the water hole, for, it was the water, the trails come into it. And so I, we, took a, we took a picture, I think it's going to be on the th thing of what it looked like in, in 97 or so. And then now, you know, here it is. Uh, this is the kind of improvement we're seeing all over the ranch for riparians. Um, it's the willow and the, uh, the beaver, there's lots of beaver right above it, the beaver ponds, the, the, the creek is even on this really, really dry year. The creek is still running, and this is a major source for our neighbors. Uh, the home ranch, Ruby and Domingo, have a long pipeline that comes out of this creek right here. And if I honestly believe if we didn't have all of the dams and the different th things that are the riparian conditions that we have above here, they would not ha have the water that they're having now to be able to get it out onto their range. So, they, you know, and that's what we're doing for drought. That, what are we doing, you know, the question is what, how is the drought affecting you and what are you doing? And um, I'm gonna let Kinsey, my daughter Mackenzie uh, talk about the immediate effects of the drought because it definitely has an effect on our herd and what we're doing. But um, we seemed, we're a little bit insulated 
from the drought. We've, we've created a cushion here that has helped a lot in that, and that is just having good resilient land and riparians and creeks and, um, and, and we're able to, we're able to, to, uh, to get through this without it being as drastic as it would be if we didn't have good, good habitat. So. Gosh, drought, um, how it has impacted us personally. Um, like Dad had uh, alluded to earlier, we have been pretty buffered um, with the drought. It seems like it just kind of hit home. It hit hard, hit home hard this year, really, really bad. Um, last year was pretty tough, but we were able to continue our same grazing rotation that we usually do. We had, um, but it, I guess what we felt the effects from last year going into this year, we didn't have the regrowth that we rely on to have stockpile feed to turn out into. But luckily, this year we had absolutely no green up. I've never seen a year where you don't have any green up outside. Um, and if it wasn't for having the management plan that, that we had, we had stockpile feed ahead of us. Um, and that's what we used all year. We haven't touched a single allotment that we didn't have rested um, from last year, just because we didn't get the regrowth on the outside. Um, so, so last year we went through without, we actually were optimistic. We bought into a few more cows this last fall. And now this year, that whole, our original plan kind of tur got turned upside down and we're having to really cull back. We've culled all of our replacement heifers, our bred heifers we sent down the road. We're really taking a cut back on, on the amount of numbers that we can run. You can cull numbers and get to that level that you're sustainable. You can you can cull numbers, but there's a big economic factor when it comes to that, and that's that's pretty hard. So virtual, the virtual fence is working with Vents V E N C E and the University of Nevada Reno, and it's a color technology. A virtual collar technology put on cows. It's like a dog fence, a wireless dog fence. Um, right now, the tech they have a box and a weight at the bottom of their collar. Um, we, with the buckle, we put them on our cows, and that, and then we have five tower locations set up on our, on the ranch. And these collars talk to the tower, and the tower is what relays all your messaging. So you, we can. We have an app we can get in there and we can draw our little polygon up on our on our map and we send that data to our cows and they receive that data and that's how that's how it communicates i guess it, it receives when those cows push up against that fence line they're getting an audio cue when they push through the audio cue they get a management shock <laughs> Electrical stimulation. Electrical stimulation, yeah. Got to be proper in my terminology. Um, so on the outside landscape, it's just really cool. Uh, our forest service, we have no back boundary. So you can put your polygon, your, your virtual fence up there and utilize country that you've never, that wouldn't, even, wouldn't have the potential to be used. But not only can you do it on the outside, but we've used it as you know how you traditionally set up a poly wire fence and strip graze down. You can do that same effect as strip grazing down through your meadows using this collar technology. It's really cutting edge. I think it's got huge possibilities, potential. Um, we got a few kinks we need to work out. Well, once those get dialed in, it's going to be pretty cool. We're pretty excited to be involved with it. Okay, the Shoe Soul Resource Management Group consists of three ranches. Um, there's uh, the Cottonwood, which is here. There's the Home Ranch, which belongs to the u -Harts. And then there's the Hubbard Vineyard, which is the Boyce Ranches, uh, the Boyce family. You know, and you, you can go into a lot of different historical things about the breed and all of that, but it's high desert. It gets really hot in the summertime, really cold in the wintertime. 
Well, those, nat those cattle just like to sit on the creeks. It's, it's cool, it's where water is, it's shade, and they, they definitely impacted the riparians tremendously. Though I b truly believe a lot of the damage to riparians that we deal we've dealt with dealt with happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It was you, you, we didn't even know that there really was something going on wrong. Um, it's that old "you don't know what you don't know" type of thing. So we invited anybody that wanted to. Uh, come participate in this to, to a meeting here at the ranch and about 50 people showed up and uh, that was in 96 and uh, we, we sort of went through a holistic class together all of us and, uh, and it, things were set in place and so we were off and rolling. Um, in those years we met almost monthly now we meet three times a year but we truly have everybody sitting at the table. We have all the state agencies, we have all the federal agencies, we have neighbors, we have um, anybody that's interested in the public, and uh, we talk about what we're, uh, what we're doing. And um, so, uh, you know, the other thing is, is I thought I knew this ranch. I mean, I was, I was a year old when they moved on it, and, and heck, I know where everything's at and stuff, but when we started, when you really start looking at what everything that that you do impacts and has an impact on on other things and you start getting down on your hands and knees and looking at the grasses and looking at the insects and all of the things that are out there i i didn't i i realized hell i don't know anything about this place and it it started a a learning for me that it's just continued it's just been phenomenal what if you open your mind and you start bring it, it, what there is to learn out there is amazing, so. So, uh, as you may know, Nevada is the driest state in the, in the Union. Um, these wetlands provide a very important uh, stopover place for a, a host of bird species. The refuge was established uh, primarily for migratory birds uh, with an emphasis on breeding waterfowl. Uh, we're one of the most uh, southernmost breeding areas for redheads. We raise a lot of canvas backs and other ducks as well. But it's also important for shorebirds and wading birds such as white-faced ibis. It also provides uh, a haven for a number of mammals as well. Lots of aquatic mammals such as muskrats here uh, we're definitely uh, a connection between a lot of different areas in the West. We have, uh, based on banding data, we know that we're a direct connection with Great Salt Lake. A lot of our birds go down to Southern California and Mexico. And uh, most of our redheads, surprisingly, migrate between here and the Texas coast. So it's a great stopover area, uh, both during the spring and the fall migration. Uh, breeding area in the summer and then in the winter most of the birds are gone because it's frozen over but the one unique species that we do have that actually comes here in the winter are trumpeter swans. Uh, drought uh, here is cyclic as it might be in other places. Um, about uh, 10 to 12 years ago we got into a drought cycle that lasted about five years uh, a lot of the wetlands were dry at that time because of the lack of water. This is a totally a spring-fed marsh. There's no streams coming in or out. So we have about 220 springs that feed the marsh, mostly from snowpack. So when that snowpack disappears, the springs um, over time uh, start to slow down and so we lose water. Um, a lot of the vegetation changes when, uh, when you go into a drought. The wetlands dry up. Uh, more vegetation, more dense vegetation comes about. And then during the wet cycles when the, the wetlands are full again, uh, some of those uh, plant species will actually drown out and you'll have more of a interspersion of open water and uh, vegetation which is good for a lot of bird species um, to have that mix of open water and, 
and vegetation. It looks like we're going into another dry cycle here. We've been dry for a couple of years now. The winters have been pretty mild. Because of the lag time on the springs, we've been able to uh, maintain our water here pretty well. If we see another uh, continued drought, um, we're going to see more dry wetlands. So um, it does affect our management here for sure. Um, a lot of the times the drought can uh, actually work with our management to a certain extent. Uh, we do have the ability to move water between wetland units. And uh, for example, right now our north marsh is completely dry. Normally we would have at least some water out there for the birds. But um, we've actually kept it dry on purpose uh, so that we can address some invasive species. We've got salt cedar that's growing out there. It's a lot easier to go after that stuff when it's dry. So if we're in a very wet cycle, um, it's hard for us to put water um, into all of these wetlands when we've got a lot of water. So it's kind of an advantage at this point to be able to dry that out and work on it. We're also working on some of our other managed wetlands, um, mowing, burning, disking to reduce the density of bulrush out there. So we can use those uh, you know, drier periods to our advantage. And then when the water comes back, we can flood those areas up. They're all refreshed. And uh, that refreshed vegetation is good for the birds as well. You know, wetland management is an interesting, uh, is an interesting subject. It's about half science and half art. So you have to really kind of read the wetlands and um, you can't really use a prescription. You can't say I'm going to draw uh, this wetland unit down every five years and work it up. You have to read the vegetation. You have to see what the, what the birds are doing, how they're reacting, and then uh, adapt your management accordingly. If you try to go uh, on a strict prescription, Mother Nature is gonna, gonna fool you. So. Um, refuges throughout the United States, the number one issue and probably uh, the number one resource drain on refuges is invasive species. Ruby Lake Refuge is actually very fortunate. I've been to a lot of different refuges um, we have some invasive species, not as bad as some folks. Some of them I think we can actually eradicate. Um, but our limitation there is uh, both in terms of personnel and expertise. We work with a lot of different uh, folks from different walks of life, different agencies, and we're constantly gathering information on the best way to deal with some of these invasive species. Um, our Limited staff size uh, limits the amount of interactions that we can have with folks. I mean, it, it just takes time, plain and simple, to, uh, to gather the, you know, the best information you can. Uh, we're constantly working on invasive species, trying different techniques. Um, and if we can try, you know, with more people and more resources, more techniques to figure out what really works the best, uh, that would help us out quite a bit. So, um, one of the things that I think a lot of folks don't understand about our wetland management is that uh, we are very, very popular for fishing out here. It's a, a long legacy of fishing. Uh, I was actually in town yesterday and talked to a, a vendor at random and he was telling me about how his grandpa brought him out here fishing. And I hear those stories all the time. And I just, I love hearing that about the people that have been coming here for basically their whole lives. Um, what I think a lot of folks don't understand is that uh, we are a limited resource of water. And we do our best to manage the water for multiple uses as, uh, you know, for our visitors as well as for the wildlife. And wherever we put water, it means that we don't have water somewhere else. Um, and so people come out here and they ask, well, why is this wetland dry? Well, it may be in a number of things. It may be that we want it dry so we can work in it. It may be that we just don't have the water to put there 
and we're trying to keep the water where where folks are going and where the where the biggest bang for the buck is for both the wildlife and the visitors. So, um, you know, I do talk to people out here as much as I can. I ask the fishermen how they're doing and how they're catching fish. And uh, if they ask me those questions, I certainly try to answer them. Um, but that's something I think a lot of people just take for granted. It's a big marsh here, there ought to just be water. Um, and I hope that, I hope that next year there's at least as much water as there is this year. <clears throat> Maggie Creek Ranch is a public lands operation. About two thirds of our grazing land is public land managed by the Bureau of Land Management, which means that we have grazing permits that we must adhere to in order to graze it. And those grazing permits come with sideboards of dates that we can be on and off, on and off dates. And it, it limits, limits us to some extent in our flexibility. And <clears throat> we know that to make a place like this, that's really good cow habitat, but also pretty decent cow habitat for, for the wildlife species that we share this place with, in order to make and maintain a place like this, we know that we have to have the flexibility to graze it at different times of year. And some places on this ranch, our grazing permits don't allow us to do that. So we've been working pretty hard to sort of uh, change those sideboards and modify them to where we can graze how we know we need to, to make and maintain places like this. You know, a thing people might not realize about drought and ranching is that drought for us just adds expense at a time when we're not getting the income that we normally would anyway. So, you know, we don't have the forage base that we typically would and the quality of that forage isn't what it is. So we're, we're paid by pounds of livestock that we sell. and and our, our cattle aren't doing as well because of, you know, because the forage quality isn't there, because it's probably hotter, um, there's not as much of it. Also, we have, to, we have to move them a lot more, so we typically have to feed processed hay at, at, at least at some point during the winter. So um, for us, that means that we irrigate meadows and grow and produce hay that we feed um, January and sometimes February and and that's off as well so we don't we don't get the production of hay we need so so it means purchased purchased feed for us and that gets pretty expensive as well so it, it's why I say the drought is a gift that keeps on giving because not only is our production down but our expenses go way way through the roof and so what's what's special about a place like this well this this essential nutrient we're looking at water is is really our limiting factor for grazing our cattle in that even even on a pretty tough drought year we'll grow the forage that we need for our cattle but oftentimes we won't have the water for them to drink so so being able to have a place like this as opposed to having to haul water to our livestock or depopulate our herd because there's no water available um, that keeps us in business. We're out here right now in one of our grazing allotments, the Carlin Field, that's managed by the Bureau of Land Management. Just over my right shoulder, you can kind of see in the distance is the town of Carlin, Nevada. This spot's kind of important to us as it's a demonstration piece for a targeted grazing project we're doing. Just inside this temporary fence to the south here, is a piece that we've grazed every spring for the last two or three springs. Uh, what we're trying to do is target this invasive plant that you can kind of see in here at cheatgrass. It's a very dangerous fine fuel that makes uh, fires go from manageable to unmanageable and big. So <clears throat> what we know in Nevada is that low ground, low country like this of poorer soil, poorer quality, poor moisture tends to tends to give cheatgrass an advantage 
after it burns or, or when it's disturbed. In a place like this where cheatgrass dominates, it'll, it'll catch fire and it'll make for a big fire and go on to burn uplands that, that, that's country at risk. So what we're hoping to demonstrate here is that we can remove this fine fuel, we can create a fuel break, and we can hopefully keep those big fires from occurring. ROGER stands for Results Oriented Grazing for Ecological Resilience and it's a sort of a loosely based organization um, designed to do just that. Uh, came, came with the acronym ROGER because a lot of our members, member partners are, are government agencies and government agencies don't do anything without an acronym. So ROGER, Results Oriented Grazing for Ecological Resilience. <laughs> came together uh, a few years ago because uh, Bureau of Land Management in Nevada came out with a land use plan amendment to help conserve sage grouse. There was, there was a con concern to ranchers like me in that uh, some of the standards in that LUPA land use plan amendment we didn't think were attainable. And, so, so from that we had we had tours with agencies. We came out to places like this, and we you know we kick kick dirt on the ground, and and we could all agree in a place like this that this is what we want and that this is a good place for the bird, but but we couldn't agree how that translated into a document to try to conserve the bird. So, so we had a few meetings and 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 we gained some trust and we and we. We're smart enough to get a facilitator to help us out, and and from that we've uh, we've really expanded to just about any arena of of public lands and grazing that that you can think of, really. And 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 the good thing about it is we've have we've got uh, all the public land management agencies plus the wildlife agencies, state and federal level, and and. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of progressive ranchers and and we're able to sort of work through wicked problems of of how do we manage places like this for for sage grouse and for lawn and cutthroat trout and other things like that but we also we also work on things like wildland fire and um, problems like that 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 can lead to a lot of contention and 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 conflict, but but because we have this group and we've got trust established, we can have difficult conversations and work through them. And it's it's a it's a organization where we don't really do projects on the ground, but but we facilitate not only uh, these conversations in between ranchers and, and agencies, but also between agencies themselves and also between levels of agencies from, from, from on the ground here level to, to the state level and beyond. And, and it's really proven to be a, a worthwhile organization and I think we're doing some pretty good things. So the Department of Wildlife has assumed an, a very active role in restoration of Nevada's rangelands post wildfire. Uh, we recognized decades ago the importance of our role in partnering with land management agencies and private landowners alike to ensure the best outcomes for the rangelands and subsequently wildlife. We're here in the Eisenhood Range north of Battle Mountain today reviewing some restoration activities that the department has endeavored on on state-owned lands. So how has the Department of Wildlife been proactively involved in addressing drought issues on rangelands in Nevada? Well certainly it depends on what part of Nevada you're in and what tools we have available. Today we're, we're reviewing a site that we recently uh, began exploring a new tool in our toolbox and that's the use of Indaza Flam uh, also known as Rejuvera, uh, to treat some degraded rangelands that have altered fire regimes and are, are 
succumbing to an annual invasive uh, fire cycle. This site behind me is an extremely important area to the state's largest mule deer herd, or one of the state's largest mule deer herds, the Area 6 deer herd. Area 6 is comprised of highly nutritious and great condition summer range, but unfortunately the winter ranges, like the one behind me, have been subject to that invasive annual fire cycle that I've talked about. So we've sprayed this area here with indazaflam, with rejuvra, to try and break that cycle. This bare interspace that you can see behind me is that chemical working up the hill where we have some perennial native vegetation. That chemical is, is holding those invasive annuals back and, and is allowing those perennials to survive and thrive. And, and this gray area behind me will be an area that we're gonna begin exploring new methods and opportunities on timing to see if we can come in and seed desirable plant material in this area. So flexibility and adaptive management um, are, are absolutely necessary uh, when, when we're working in these landscapes. Uh, again, we go through a rigorous planning process whenever we are actively implementing management on, on the ground. Um, and, but even, even our best laid plans, there's always environmental variables and situations within the various entities and partnerships which we have, which uh, make us have to pivot, maybe on short notice, uh, from our direction that we had been planning towards. Uh, maybe we had a, a late summer rain that, that changed the environment in which we were operating um, to where we have to, to pivot quickly and, and change the management actions that we were intending to take. And this is a great example of a proactive and, and reactive, frankly, partnership uh, with the federal land management agencies. And so what we have here is reseeded after catastrophic wildfire uh, with desirable perennial plants. Um, this, this burned in 2016 and uh, various management actions have taken place since then. Just down the road here on the proactive side, because of the response that we received in this area, uh, we have installed a, in the cooperation with the Elko District BLM, uh, a fuel break um, considering prevailing winds and fire history in order to protect the investments behind us, um, that fuel break will serve to, to protect this area in, in the likely event that another wildfire uh, could start just, just outside the bounds of, of this great treatment. So how does the Department of Wildlife leverage uh, the resources we have to have the, the most impactful uh, outcome on, on the range. Certainly our prioritization of sites, the tools that we have, using soils data, um, all the various uh, management methods is one piece of that equation. Um, but, but probably a, a bigger piece is that partnership and the partnership between state agencies, federal land management agencies, and private landowners. And being able to use those partnerships uh, to leverage the most impactful outcome uh, for wildlife and other uses is, is really where we excel. Working as a state agency, being able to work across the boundary line with private landowners um, allows us to maximize our uh, treatment and allows us to capitalize on, on resources and, and make the design of our treatments the most beneficial to all interested parties. And having that partnership from private landowners in these situations is absolutely critical to the su success of our, um, of our program. And it's something that we pride ourselves on in trying to uh, bring, bring all these entities together as we design and implement 
uh, projects on the range.